Hello and welcome to our webinar today, ISO 45001, Demystifying the Standard. My name is Victoria Cook, I'm a Category Manager at IOSH and will be acting as the moderator for today. Before we begin, I'd just like to mention a few simple housekeeping uh, tips. So the webinar is scheduled for an hour and will include approximately 10 minutes for Q&A. If you have a question for the presenter, click the question button on the right hand side of your screen. A new pane will open and if you just type your question into the top box, then click ask. Feel free to submit your questions at any point during the presentation. We'll answer as many pos as possible during the QA. Um, if time runs out, we'll compile a FAQ document and we'll share that with you uh, in the following week. The webinar will include a couple of polls. These will last about 40 seconds each and will show a question and provide multiple response options. You just need to select the most appropriate response for yourself. Um, please note the presentation is being recorded and it will be available for future playback. Um, you'll get an email within 48 hours of the webinar and it will be loaded onto the Irish channel on YouTube as well. All participants are set to listen only, so you are on mute at the moment and you'll remain uh, in that way for the duration of the webinar. An automated questionnaire will open after the webinar with a few brief questions and we'd appreciate your feedback, which will only take a few seconds to complete. OK, so just on to our presenters for the day. So we have presenters Kershed Kutke, a trainer and consultant at SAI Global and Stephen Thomas, Health and Safety Business Partner at IOSH. Okay, um, the agenda for today, an overview of the structure of ISO 45001 uh, standard, um, review some of the key requirements of the standard, understanding what we need to do to meet these requirements, and then identifying what documented information that we need to keep. OK, we're just going to launch the first poll. So the question is on your screen. I'm just going to launch that for you now. You'll just have a few moments. OK, you should be able to see the poll now on your screens. If you'd like to select the most res uh, relevant answer. So looking at whether you're, you're new to management systems, got a basic knowledge. Um, some experience working with it or a good understanding. Just give you a few more moments. OK, I think we'll stop there. Thank you for everyone for your responses. Just going to share that with you all now. So it looks like um, around about half of you got a good understanding and then a bit of a mixture between some basic and limited knowledge and a few people there with no knowledge yet. Um, so hopefully this webinar will be really useful for those people as well. OK, and then we just have one more poll. Um, why is uh, an occupational health safety management system important to your organisation? Just launching that poll for you now. OK, just give you a few moments to respond to that one for me. OK, just a couple more moments. Great, we'll stop there. Thank you. OK, so with those responses there, what I would like to do is just hand over to our presenters. Um, Kershed um, and Stephen for some initial not comments on those uh, results and then we'll proceed with the, the webinar. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Yes, thank you, Victoria. No problem at all. Uh, I can't see the numbers on the screen as the results of the poll questionnaire. I can, okay, it's just popped up, great. So we have about 6% with uh, customer request, but by far the highest percentage is management commitment to OHS objectives. And that's very, very 
encouraging to see. So the reasons why a company implements an OHS MS can have a significant impact on how successful you will be in engaging your workers and in building a culture of improved OHS performance. If the primary reason had been customer requirements, then typically the implementation may be limited to doing just the bare minimum that's needed to satisfy customer requirements. If you're thinking about avoiding prosecution, again, it's possible that the implementation will be focused primarily on some specific regulatory requirements. And again, effectives may be limited. If you're looking at reducing illnesses and injuries and you have strong management commitment, which is what we are seeing here, then you're on the right track and you will be successful in moving forward with your management systems implementation and in maintaining it effectively. There have been several surveys done over the last uh, 15 to 20 years and the numbers that we see on cost savings are encouraging. They say that for every dollar you spend or invest, I should say, on your management system, on your safety management system, the return to the organization varies from about $2 to $7, depending upon the context of the organization and the size of the organization. Next slide, please. So what we see now is the structure of the new ISO 45001 standard. As you can see, there are 10 sections here, and these 10 sections are now part of what's called as the standardized structure of all ISO management system standards. Keep in mind it's ISO management system standards because ISO has more than 2000 standards. All of those are not affected by this standardized structure. So 9001, 14001, and other management system standards are required to stay with the structure. In addition, there's a lot of standard terminology as well. So many of the definitions are exactly the same, and there may be some variations depending upon the actual standard itself. For example, for the environmental standard, you use terminology that's relevant for the environmental standard. For the safety standard, we'll talk about risks and <clears throat> hazards. For the environmental, we'll talk about aspects and impacts. So those changes are always going to be there. Next slide, please. This is a PDCA model that most of us who are going to be familiar with, considering that all of you all have some experience, most of you all, I should say, about over 80%, have some experience with using management system standards. I'll take, uh, take a look at the very top of the screen on the left side, top left corner. The first thing there is external and internal issues. So that's 4.1. At the top in the middle is four, clause four, the context of the organization. And on the top right, you have needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties. These are very, important new concepts and we'll spend some time uh, going through them in detail and uh, what you will see is these feed in to the overall circle in the white box the white box will now take you from the context of the organization down to the planning circle which is right at the very top clause number six you then move forward to the doing part of it to so support activities things like maintaining documentation, training, HR, and so on. And critical operational components, clause number eight on the right-hand side. Once you've got all of these things in place, you have to monitor and measure these components. That's performance evaluation, make sure you do your internal audits, have your management reviews. And then on the basis of that, you do improvement actions and come back to the planning cycle. And all of this is held together by the hub the leadership and worker participation clause number five. And this is really one of the most important significant changes in the standard as well. We'll take a, another look at a similar slide now in the next one and try and look at how this uh, ties up here. So this is very similar to what we saw just a minute back. <clears throat> I'll take, take a look now at the top left corner of the image. Context of the organization, clause 4.1, it's a little more legible here. This is very crucial 
because this feeds into the planning component as well. <clears throat> the other one below that is needs and expectations of uh, interested parties. That's 4.2. And then it's uh, partially hidden here. You then define the scope and have the management system. So these clauses are very important. Like I said, uh, the rest of it is pretty similar to what we saw earlier over there. And the important point to realize here is the identical wording for many of the common requirements and the definitions makes it so much easier for a company that, for example, has an ISO 9000 management system and now wants to implement an occupation health and safety system. You'll find over 40 to 60 percent of the concepts are going to be very, very closely aligned. And now you only have to tweak the operational components and the context components and the interested party needs and so on to align yourself and establish your occupational health and safety management system. <clears throat> uh, we'll take the next slide now and Steve, uh, over to you. Thank you, Kershad. So um, for those of you wondering what's familiar um, in the new standard compared to OSAS 18001, um, for anyone who's familiar with the old standard, they'll be glad to hear that many of the core elements of the standard have been retained in ISO 45001. Some requirements that were grouped together have been moved into different sections in order to fit in with the revised framework. Other requirements are now listed under their own subsections, such as procurement, outsourcing, management of change and continual improvement. So what's new? Um, the most significant new additions are 4.1, the organisation and its context, 4.2, the needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties, and 6.1, actions to address risks and opportunities. These three clauses together provide a framework for managing health and safety and business risks and taking appropriate preventive measures. If you happen to be wondering what happened to preventive action, the phraseology that was in 18001, these three sections are an evolution of that concept which should be considered in all things as we'll see as we go through the presentation. Section 6.1 uh, includes requirements for ongoing and proactive hazard identification or what we are calling risk-based thinking. Again this concept will be explored later. So moving on to the individual sections within ISO 45001. Section 1 provides the scope. Now it's important to note that this is the scope of the standard, not the scope of the organization's management system, which is a different thing as we'll see later. Instead it defines the intent of the standard, which is to enable organizations to identify hazards, minimize risks and improve occupational health and safety performance to provide a safe and healthy workplace. Back to you Kershed. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we'll take a very quick look now at some of the components of the standard, the definitions primarily. And it's the title of this, this slide is normative references, terms and definitions. The term normative references is sometimes uh, misunderstood. What it really means is if you're going to be using the standard and there is a normative reference made, we need to know what these re normative references are because they are mandatory. Now, in our case, in the uh, 45001 standard, we do not have any normative references because the key requirements that we need to, uh, to use the standard are the terms and definitions, and these are all included within clause two of the standard. In some standards, you actually have to purchase a separate standard as, as is for 9001. So in 9001, all the terms and definitions and the concepts are in a separate standard, which is ISO 9000 standard. So you need to have two documents to fully understand all the components. If you don't refer to the normative references, then there may be some gaps in our knowledge of the understanding of the requirements and our implementation may not be as complete or as uh, aligned to the requirements as you might expect. We'll take a quick look at some of the key definitions that are new now. For example, interested party. It sounds intuitive and it really is. Example, 
at this webinar, who are the interested parties? You are interested parties, your employers are interested parties. I'm an interested party. We want to make sure the outcome of the webinar meets your expectations. So that's a key component. So an interest, interested party is anybody that can affect or be affected by a decision made by the organization. In the real world, if you're a manufacturing plant and you're spewing smoke out of your smokestack and it's falling on people's homes in the neighborhood, their health is going to be affected. They are interested parties. Anybody who buys your products and the product is potentially harmful, they are interested parties. Your workers are interested parties. Your employers, the owners, they're all interested parties. We'll take a look at another definition. Uh, let's take a look at participation. That's further down here on the left side. <clears throat> this is a new term. It, it's not a new term, it was there, but it's been made clear now. The definition is involvement in decision-making. And the other associated term is consultation, which means seeking views before making a decision. Both of these are requirements of the standard. They're mandatory requirements and primarily relate to workers. So there's a whole section now on worker participation and consultation. And this is crucial because the people who are injured most often or fall ill as well are the workers. And if we don't get input from them, then we could be missing a very important piece as an input into our improvement initiatives. Uh, hazard is a fairly understood, well understood concept. It's the source with a potential to cause injury and ill health. And the associated term risk is basically uncertainty. In the occupation health and safety context, risk is typically uh, done based upon the likelihood of something happening and the severity of injury or harm. Taking a very, very simple example that everybody goes through almost every day if you're driving a car, driving is a hazard. We perceive that as a hazard. But is the risk the same for everybody? No. If you're driving on a nice, quiet country road, the risk is relatively low. Now, if you're driving in icy conditions, snow conditions, dark, you're a teenager, you've got your friends in the car, you may have a couple of drinks and you're holding a cell phone, the risk level has gone through the roof. So the same activity, driving, is the hazard, but the risk levels depend upon many, many factors and the context of the activity. So that's important to keep in mind. The same activity can have different levels of risk. So an, a, a very experienced worker operating a lift truck knows the company's layout, lower risk, well-trained. New employee coming into the place, not familiar with the layout, the risk is higher. So your controls need to be more disciplined and effectively applied. We'll take a look maybe at one more definition here. Uh, the opportunity. In terms of opportunities, basically what we're looking at is something that enables the occupational health and safety system. Let's move on to the context of the organization now. <clears throat> These are the three crucial new clauses of the standard. The first one, we are going to re be required to determine the external and internal issues. Issues is a term that we normally refer to when we say there is a concern. The second clause is determine the needs and expectations of workers and other interested parties. Very, very important component again. And thirdly, the scope of the management system. We will focus on 4.1 and 4.2 in greater detail here. Next slide. So let's look at external and internal issues. What are these? These could be related to your supplies, your subcontractors on the left-hand side, external issues. So if your suppliers are not delivering to you on time, that's an issue. Keep in mind that issues and interested parties often go hand in hand. So now the interested party, of course, is your organization, your customers, and also your suppliers. They want to have your business. 
but if they don't meet your requirements, you need to address these issues. Market conditions. Is there anything you can do about those? In some cases, maybe, maybe not. A regulatory change. What if something is changing that's gonna impact your manufacturing process or the product that you make? Can you do something about that? So what you will see in external issues particularly, you may have less control over, over what can be done. You may be able to have some influence and there's a risk now to your business and to your occupational health and safety management system potentially. So depending on these situations, we need to act. And keep in mind that risk and opportunity go hand in hand in every single situation. So if there's a regulatory change coming up, if you're going to be an early uh, adopter of the change, you can beat your competition, get ahead of them, and get your product to market ahead of the others. So the risk is one component and the opportunity, they go hand in hand all the time. And this is something that the standard is very interested in promoting because not everything is a negative perspective. We'll take a look at the internal issues quickly. Management components. If you have poor management, you're going to have a hard time implementing your standard. If they're not committed, you won't get the investment for the, uh, for the OHS program. If the leadership is not engaged and doesn't create that culture, it's going to be an uphill battle for you. Information technology, one of the biggest risks in companies today, cybersecurity. Your communication must be good. Sending an email out and hoping everybody understands everything not the most effective way. Talking to people, engaging with them, involving them and getting their participation, help get them to be involved as part of the decision-making process. Your equipment, your premises, workplace culture, all of these are key internal issues. In some cases, something may be both an internal and an external issue. Extreme weather conditions, for example, you cannot do much about it, but you are required from an occupation health and safety to plan contingency measures, that's your emergency response planning and so on. So these are crucial inputs to your planning component. Next slide. So we did mention that the issues are typically associated with interested parties. And the standard says you must be able to basically determine the other interested parties. Your workers, of course, are your primary interested parties and you get lots of input from them. Other interested parties may be owners, financiers, customers, the community, regulators, and others. So first, in order to determine what these interested parties want, we need to know who they are. So if we look at the bottom uh, uh, bullet, what are the needs and expectations of workers and the interested parties? How do you find out? We talk to them, we research them online, and we engage with them. And that's the best way. In some cases, keep in mind, your competitors are an interested parties because they want to find out what you are doing. They want to hire your best people. And you should be looking at that as well sometimes as an opportunity. So keep in mind that this is a very, very dynamic activity. It changes all the time. Perceptions change. Your customers' needs might change. So therefore, your context is changing. So the context components are primarily the needs and expectations of workers and interested parties and the issues, and of course, the scope of your, of your management system as well. We'll move on now and uh, Steve, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Kershed. Um, so looking at the scope of the management system, so this is the scope of the organization's management system. It's important to note that the scope of the system must include activities, products and services that are within the organization's control or influence and which may impact occupational health and safety performance. Must also take into account the needs and expectations of workers and interested parties in the state of the products, services and boundaries to which the management system applies. Now, I have some experience with ISO 9001 as well as OSAS 18001 and now 45001. And uh, I know that there can be a temptation to de-scope difficult or potentially costly elements um, relating to the business. For instance, if you have um, centralized resources that are dealt with by a head um, office or, or if you're a group of companies, the main parent company, the temptation may be to de-scope those because they're not directly relevant to your site, to your operation. But the new standard, it makes you think, well, we need to 
bring all of those things on board, you can't just kind of forget about them as you may have done with, with certain other certifications. I'm thinking 9001 in particular, there might be that little temptation to descope it based on the service that you're providing. So one particular service you may not have within the scope of 9001, the other one that you might. Um, so with the new um, 45001 standard, if you do this, um, it might compromise your chance of certification and it will also undermine the value of the management system in relation to health and safety. You can't just suddenly descope a service, uh, a group of people, or a function, or a site. Um, you need, do need to think about those as part of the whole um, standard and uh, application of that. Uh, coming to leadership and commitment, um, certain clauses require action by top management, which may not be delegated to other persons. The actions listed here are specific responsibilities that top management must personally direct or be engaged in performing. For me, one of the standout requirements is that top management must develop, lead and promote a culture, that word culture, that supports an effective occupational health and safety management system. This focus on culture is important, must be well evidenced if ISO 45001 certification is to be achieved. It will be the job of the occupational health and safety practitioner to help enable and support that top management, but there has to be evidence of top level engagement with a positive culture. Now, my background is in consultancy, so I've spoken to a heck of a lot of employers in the past, and dare I say, some of the top management have been a little disengaged when it comes to health and safety. It's often a health and safety practitioner who uh, gets the, um, I wouldn't say poison chalice, but gets the, um, the responsibility for delivering health and safety um, with perhaps little input from the top management, uh, just maybe a bit of resource, a little bit of support, but that's about it. So what the standard does now, there's very much a focus on this culture thing. So it's important that you can evidence the culture. This means top management being visible on matters of health and safety. They need to actively lead on these things. They should be involved in projects, in the direction, um, and must take responsibility and accountability for this as well. Um, on this slide, uh, we can see some of the documented information uh, that must be maintained in order to demonstrate adequate leadership and commitment. Um, so um, we've got um, occupational health and safety policies um, and objectives which must be established. They must be evidenced. Um, we need to show um, documentation relating to the integration of the management system into business processes. Um, you have to show that adequate resources were made available. So this is maybe financial information. This is evidence um, that you are actually providing adequate resource. Um, occupational health and safety management system outcomes are achieved. Um, important there. Um, must have evidence of consultation and participation um, and the processes uh, around that to show that they're being actively implemented. So again, this is a big thing in the standard consultation, participation, all different levels. We will come back to that one. And then finally, ensuring and promoting continual improvement, um, making sure that that's evidenced as well. So again, we'll touch on that. Uh, moving on, um, we're looking at policy roles, responsibilities, authorities, consultation and participation of workers. So um, the policy in particular has certain new commitments that must be included. For example, a specific commitment to eliminate hazards and reduce occupational health and safety risks, along with a commitment to the consultation and participation of workers. Now that is new and specific to this particular standard. Um, it wasn't quite there in, in 18,001. Responsibilities need to be assigned and communicated to all levels and functions within the organisation. So again, this is that culture change. So um, whereas before you might just have the bulk of the um, health and safety duties falling on maybe the safety person, maybe a facilities person, what we're now looking at is all the way through all levels and functions within the organisation, all the way from the top, the chief executive, 
all the way down through the lap through the ranks um, line managers they will all have uh, and be expected to evidence um, responsibilities uh, and what they're doing to fulfill those responsibilities for health and safety um, lastly um, time training and resources must be provided to enable consultation and participation of workers with the management system and again this is important to all levels and functions within the organization uh, Kershed back to you thank you Steve so now we come to the planning activities so with all of the information that we've gathered from the earlier stages of the occupational health and safety we've now basically got the uh, issues identified we know who the interested parties are and so on so going down through these six points on your slide 6.1.1 we have to start taking some actions we have to do hazard identification assessment of risks opportunities determining legal requirements and getting down to the planning action at 6.1.4 so how do we what are the inputs here to this planning action we remember the plan do check act cycle and those bubbles which are flowing into the planning this is where the rubber hits the road basically so we've gathered information about all of the issues that we face internal issues external issues for each of them we would have identified is it a risk or an opportunity? We also would now have found out who the interested parties are. For example, the technology, the supplier is in a nation country, we need to work with them. How can we make sure that we get all of the information in a timely manner? You have to work with the interested parties. Are they sharing information that they gather from you to your competitors? That's a risk. So you have to work the risk and the opportunity concurrently. So you work with your interested parties, you know who they are, you know whether they're on your side or maybe not on your side. Your competitors are maybe gathering information. Be watchful for that. Factor these components in. You've also defined the scope of your management system and you've got your leadership and worker participation consultation all taken care of. That's those are the points that Steve covered in the previous slides. You've got your policy established, roles defined. With all of this information, we now should have a solid foundation to move forward with planning your occupation health and safety management system. This is where we really have to put things together and start your detailed work to make sure we get together and have ongoing positive, uh, proactive identification of hazards. So now I'm moving on from the first bullet point, actions to address risk and opportunities to the hazard identification. So we should have been doing that for the pre earlier components, but there's day-to-day -day hazard identification in your workplace. You have a new piece of equipment in your workplace. What hazard identification have you done? What risk assessment have you done? And are there any opportunities when you made this change in equipment to upgrade the equipment, make it safer, get new safety uh, barriers installed, and train your people as well? Look at the opportunities as well in these situations. Very importantly, at 6.1.3, you would have now got to make sure what are the legal requirements for anything you do in the workplace. So you know about the standard things about <clears throat> ensuring you have safety practices, personal protective equipment, making sure you're aware of the legal requirements. What is your process? We have to get into the details by establishing regular strong processes for ongoing and proactive identification of hazards that means any employee any manager anybody walking in the plant in your facilities should be keeping your eyes open there's a piece of some some uh, packages are left over here this could be coming in the way of the forklift truck that's going to be moving in the here all day so is that a hazard what are we going to do about it who do we informed how do we make sure that that hazard is removed immediately? How do we make sure it doesn't happen again? Was there some training that had been missed? Were people unaware of this? Find out these factors so that they do not happen again. Make sure you covered your legal legal requirements, and then we move forward into the detailed components. When it comes to legal requirements, I find sometimes that companies do it on an annual basis. But do legal requirements change annually? Not necessary. 
your process must include some methodology to make sure you be you are, are informed of any changes some large organizations actually have legal firms that make sure that they provide you with all of the information but once they provide that information to you what do we actually do with it that's very important so if there's something that's in the manufacturing area that affects the manufacturing for example there are new requirements for machine guarding or for pre-start health and safety reviews we need to know about it if we don't know about it we cannot meet them so you need to have a process for staying informed of the new changes and of any uh, other requirements that might come in very importantly communicate these requirements to the relevant persons and then make sure you actually comply with these requirements as well you have seen uh, md and rd in some of the slides what these little symbols mean are that you're required to maintain documentation in some cases and this is new terminology maintaining uh, documentation is the equivalent of what we used to call a procedure retaining documentation is the equivalent of having a record to demonstrate that what you've done we'll move on to the next slide so now we've got some component of the planning done this is also in some ways uh, uh, an, uh, a replica of the original slide we had on the, on the plan to check act so 4.1 the external issues needs and expectations of workers and interested parties and the scope have been defined they feed into the planning process but there's other components and that these are the hazards they feed into the planning process as well so if you have a hazard you do the risk assessment you may have to ha do something about those things you've got ohs and other risks as well other risks may include business risks cyber security and other factors which could affect your management system and subsequently your ohs as well legal and other requirements so this is a pictorial representation of the information we've covered in the previous two slides and prior to that as well uh, let's move on to the next slide once we've understood what our hazards are what our risks are opportunities are legal requirements issues interested parties when you come to the planning Typically, there will be some high level strategic objectives and there may be tactical objectives that are implemented in specific work areas. So we need to prioritize our stuff. We may have about 30 or 40 different things that we've identified as risks and opportunities. Some companies have more than that. Which are the ones we're going to be working on on a priority basis? What are the high risk areas? Legal and other requirements normally trump everything you have to make sure if there's a legal requirement that you are not meeting you must make sure that you get onto that at the first opportunity and make sure you comply with legal requirements the consequences can be very damaging to the organization and to the health and safety as well if you haven't got a particular safety feature in place somebody could get injured the consequences of that financial are dire as well your plant may be shut down for an extended period of time and you would have to do a lot more work to get back on track and meet your customers requirements as well so when it comes to objectives we should be de developing objectives that help to continually improve the ohs management system and your ohs performance very importantly these objectives must be clear in stating the intended outcome and how these objectives will be measured i have seen objectives that say in a generic uh, manner, we want to improve our OHS uh, injury rate in the manufacturing area, not very specific. So I had a case, a company had about 70 employees and they literally had approximately 40 to 50 cuts and bruises, primarily in the arms and the elbow area and the hands. And I was auditing them for about two years now, the second year running, I said, you still have the same number of injuries and back pain and all of these things. You are required to improve your performance. If you continue with this, it may be a major non-conformity next year. Next year, I went there, I saw their objective. They said, we want to improve and reduce the number of cuts and injuries by 10%. I asked them, how did you pick 10%? 
we didn't know what to do actually. So, but we picked that as a reasonable number. I said, what were your results? We had a 72% improvement. I was impressed with that. I asked, what did you do? They planned amazingly well. The problem they found was in the stamping operations, the punch press. So all the parts that were being stamped from the hydraulic presses, they often had sharp edges. They decided, why are these sharp, there sharp edges here? They found that once the die gets a little old, after 20,000 strikes, the die is getting blunt and the edges are sharp. Our people are wearing protective equipment and gloves, but they're not very good. We got better gloves. We decided to reduce the number of strikes we use on a die. We were doing 30,000 strikes, now we did 25,000. We had fewer sharp edges. We also changed the conveyor line system so that instead of lifting the part of the conveyor, turning around and putting it onto the pallet, we just made the conveyor straight now instead of having it, and we brought it right above the pallet so you only help it onto the job. Impressive stuff, they achieve their objectives, but they planned effectively. So that's an important component of how you plan for these objectives. Now, when you plan these components as well for objectives, your planning to achieve must be clear in defining who's going to do the job. Have you given the resources? Have you designated responsibilities? What needs to be done exactly? What are the timelines? What are the performance indicators to be monitored? And how will you measure your success? So the example I gave you, they hadn't done it all that way, but in the future, they learned that they have to document these things and make sure they keep records of all of these components. Back to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Kershed. Um, so we'll just quickly skim through the last few of the um, sections of the standard, uh, and then we'll come up to some little uh, summing up bits, and then we'll do the Q&A. Um, so firstly, support. Uh, section 7 incorporates many of the requirements from Section 4 of OSAS 18001 relating to compliance, awareness and communication. These are enhanced requirements relating to communication and the use of the new term documented information under 7.5. Um, by the way, you'll see um, on the, the slide here and on the others, uh, the MD and the RDs. Uh, that's for maintained documentation and retained documentation. So there are specific requirements around these um, that we'll make uh, clear. Um, moving on to the next slide, which is operations. Um, so we've got two new sections within here. Firstly, while OSAS 18001 did cover change management to some degree, the management of change has its own section now in ISO 45001, 8.1.3. This obviously ties in well with the emphasis on identifying risks and opportunities and that risk-based thinking. Secondly, 8.1.4 specifically addresses procurement-related risks with risk and control requirements for contractors and outsourced functions and processes. In terms of performance evaluation, um, Evaluation of compliance, internal audit, and management review will be familiar to anyone who dealt with OSAS 18001. However, it's worth pointing out that monitoring should not just be around reactive indicators, such as accidents. Um, they're the obvious one, accidents, um, obviously they're the, they're the big showy things, depending on the type of site. If you're low risk, you may not, you may not have that many, uh, but it might be the big important thing for higher risk manufacturing, for instance. Um, so th that is a, a valid um, indicator, but it's reactive. What we want is a mixture of both proactive and reactive indicators, or leading and lagging indicators as they're sometimes known. Um, examples of proactive indicators can include inspections. Uh, that could either be sort of internal inspection, safety tours, or it could be from an enforcing body or your insurers. Audits, internal or external again training programs that are in place and the evidence for those. Safety meetings, uh, internal safety meetings, could be uh, your committee meetings, it could be toolbox talks, that kind of thing. Engagement in occupational health and safety activities. So the uptake of any sort of campaigns, maybe you've got a well-being campaign that you're trying to bring in, um, if you can measure engagement with that. So for instance, at IOSH, we offered free health checks recently. Um, so we judged the take up of those as a good indicator 
of people's engagement with our health and well-being program internally at IOSH. Again, that's a good indicator. And uh, also maintenance of premises and equipment. So not just your statutory stuff that you have to get done, but also other proactive maintenance that you've got in place. They're all good indicators, proactive. Moving on to improvement. Um, there are a few noteworthy points here. Firstly, as mentioned before, preventive action has been removed in favour of risk-based thinking. Clause 10.2 requires the participation of workers and the involvement of relevant interested parties in the incident, non-conformity and corrective action processes. Continual improvement has also been given more importance and is mentioned 36 times in this standard compared with 18 times in 18,001. That's a good indicator of the importance that continual improvement has been given in the new standard. Um, one of the good things um, about the standard um, and all of the Annex SL based management systems is their capability for integration. Now, I myself, like I mentioned before, have been involved in ISO 9001. I'm also on a project team uh, for ISO 27001, information security. Uh, and um, there's also a lot of crossover, obviously, with ISO 14, uh, 14001. So um, again, that Annex SL, um, it does give you a solid framework to apply across all of those different standards. Um, the good thing is documents and mechanisms such as legal registers, instant reporting systems, non-conformity and corrective action systems and internal auditing can all be utilized across multiple disciplines. Whether you use the same people, whether you have a project team, um, whether you have um, electronic systems. Uh, for instance, uh, we recently rolled out um, an instant reporting system within IOSH, um, electronic using Microsoft Forms. Um, we're intending to use that initially for health and safety for 45,001, but we'll also extend that to 27,001 now that we're looking at that for information security as well. Um, obviously, having this, um, this approach, an integrated approach, allows a consistent and efficient approach to compliance as well as saving time, effort and resource. And finally, um, some parting tips for you um, based on my, my experience as, as both an auditor and someone who's trying to, to um, implement the standards within organizations. So firstly, it's important to involve business functions such as project management and business analysts. They can really help your integration and your implementation to take off. They're good. Uh, at breaking down barriers. So if you've got a very siloed organization, for instance, you know, you've got your different arms of the business, maybe different sites, they're a good way of stepping across that uh, and reaching all the different parts that you need to. Um, a strong implementation plan is important. So um, I know that some people like a Gantt chart. Uh, I'm partial to one myself. But uh, sometimes other options such as T-maps might better illustrate what can be achieved. It's a nice visual um, cue, something that we've been using here. And it's, it's really appreciated by top management that they can just see that roadmap. So if you don't know what a T-map is, I suggest that you, you give it a good Google and have a look. Um, speaking with my auditor's hat on, I believe that simplicity is key when it comes to management systems. So there's a temptation to throw everything into your processes and your policy documents. Um, if you're an auditor going along, maybe you're there to do um, the certification for the business. Maybe you're doing a gap analysis, something like that. You want nice, simple documentation and you want evidence that it's being followed. Um, you don't need to throw in all of the different um, avenues, all of the different elements that you um, you don't necessarily need. Keep them simple uh, and make sure that they're pitched at the right level, of course, as well. Um, write them in plain language, particularly if you're uh, an international organization. Plain language is important. Um, avoid jargon, acronyms, and also provide relevant content in accessible formats and languages um, for people. It's also sensible to limit legislation references to the legal register wherever possible. The temptation is um, to put in lots of legal references. It adds weight behind what you're trying to achieve. Um, but unfortunately, um, it can be a chore to keep up to date. If you've got a lot of documents referring, referencing different legislation, it can be a nightmare to update. And also, dare I say, it can be quite boring to read if you're not a safety person as well. And finally, 
uh, as a modern um, health and safety professionals, we all need to lead the way for our organisations when it comes to certification to ISO 45001. It's important to inform our leaders about their role and ensure that they understand the size of the task and the level of commitment for themselves and the organisation. We all need to speak the language of business by providing business cases that demonstrate the value of occupational health and safety interventions and the management systems around that. To put this into context, um, IOSH does have a publication, The Healthy Profit, uh, that's worth a download and a read. It puts um, the business focus on health and safety into sharp focus for you. And with that, we'll move on to our Q&A. Okay, so thank you very much for both of our presenters. Um, it is now time for question and answer. Um, so what I'm going to do, I think uh, a lot of you have been sending in some questions and there's been a couple of common themes. Um, so I'll start with those ones uh, at the beginning. Um, so there's just a, a question, uh, I'm not sure who would like to answer this one first, around um, the terminology of opportunity. So giving examples of what opportunity really means. I'm not sure who would like to dive in on that one, please. Kershed, you wrote the standard, so feel free to pick this one up. <laughs> Great. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, we, we understand the concept of uh, risk, basically, but the concept of opportunity is something that enables occupational health and safety performance. So let me just pull up the definition over here and see what I can find here. So just as they define occupational health and safety risk as the likelihood of occurrence of an adverse event and the likelihood of severity of injury and ill health, an opportunity from the occupational health and safety perspective is defined as a circumstance or a set of circumstances that can lead to improvement of OHNS performance. Now, let's take a simple example. You've been working on a machine and you've been having problems and the guarding isn't quite good. The sensors aren't working very well and people are having difficulties and somebody is getting injured occasionally in a minor way. So here's an opportunity. You're going to have to do some maintenance. So, okay, fix it and make it as good as like it was before or spend a little bit of money and get a more advanced sensor and you have seized the opportunity to eliminate that health and safety issue for good. And you have improved your health and safety performance. You've also made a commitment now showed people that you're listening to your workers' interests and are creating improved health and safety environments. Does that clarify the, uh, 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 does it answer the question? I think so. Thank you very much, Kershed. Um, okay, we'll just move on to the next question. OK, um, I'll pick this one up. We've got a question from a David Mercer. Uh, the question is, do we expect the achievement of ISO 45001 will be accepted as full evidence of third party auditors, for example, CHAS? So for those who uh, aren't in the UK, this is the Contractor Health and Safety Assessment Scheme. Uh, it's a third party contractor approval scheme uh, of which we have quite a few in the UK. Uh, all fits in with the safety standards in procurement um, scheme. So um, to answer the question, um, in my experience advising people trying to get through CHAS, um, it'll be taken as um, full evidence that you have a compliant management system in place, that there are standards being met. Um, what they will probably also ask for is um, evidence around training in particular depending on what your what kind of work that you'll be tendering for so for instance if it's related to construction work they'll be wanting to make sure that there are safety passports in place cses cards that kind of thing um and uh, they'll also ask for evidence of competence um for people if there's equipment being used they may ask for evidence of um testing and examination um so ISO 45001 won't be the be all and end all it won't be just a you know a, a rubber stamp job they will actually ask for more evidence uh, but it will take you a heck of a long way and they may not even ask for your safety policy um, for risk assessments other than relating to the specific job that you're you're actually going for I hope that answers the question 
Great, okay. Um, we've got a couple of quick questions here as well. So uh, one from Lee Bennett, when must we move over to 45,001 from 18,001? Okay. Keshet? I can take that. Uh, yes, the standard was published on the 12th of March this year, 2018. And as with uh, all of our previous management system transitions, the International Accreditation Forum has determined that all companies will have up to three years to transition to the new ISO 45001 standard. So those of us who are certified to 18001 standard 2007, what it means is we need to transition before the 12th of March 2021. So you have a three year transition period in which to start implementing the changes. Okay, thank you very much, Kershed. That's great. Um, okay, so a couple more questions then. Um, a query here on what's the top three major non-conformances um, and what the, the certification bodies encounter in the new certification? So I suppose that might be a good one for you, Kershed, if you think there's anything that you can highlight there. All right. Uh, unfortunately, Auditors like to sometimes focus on the documentation components. And that's easy pickings typically, but that shouldn't be the focus of the non-conformities. The real issues we often find when companies are working on this, we sometimes find that the corrective action process has not been effectively uh, managed. People do audits, they write non-conformities, and then they start fixing the issue based on the symptom without delving into the root cause. This is one of the things that we have been focusing on extensively over the last several years. So proper effective root cause analysis is crucial. So we say that uh, this, in, this person got injured while uh, operating this machine. What is the cause? Uh, he was possibly not paying attention. All right. So we say, okay, that's it. And we say, okay, we'll, we counsel the operator to be more attentive. That's not adequate. Why was the person not attentive? Were they doing something else? Were they preoccupied trying to do two jobs at the same time? Or were there other factors? Delving down deep, we've talked about the five Y approach and the eight D approach and all of these. That root cause is critical. If you think it was just an attention issue, and quickly get it out of the way, you may be missing something else as well. It may not even have been that issue. It may be just that the machine requires too much activity happening at the same time, and the settings are changing. That's why the operator has to do those things. Do those things. So we need to look deeply into the root causes. That's one of the key components that we find as a significant issue. Other issues that we come across is, Sometimes things are missed in the objectives and the detail of the objectives as well. Leadership and commitment is a delicate one to raise a non-conformity on, but we have seen cases where top management is primarily sitting in the office and very minimally engaged. We don't have too many non-conformities on that because it's a hard one to pick on. Worker participation is an area we've been seeing increasingly. People just send out an email they said, we sent the email out to employees. We told them these are the changes. We expect that they'll read it. That's not participation, that's not engagement, that's not consultation. So these are issues we've been facing, seeing more and more. Other components, uh, hazard identification and risk assessment. Often I find that the audit is happening maybe next week, and I see that you have a list of about 40 hazards and risks, and you've done the rating and all of those things, and you had somebody going through that hazard and uh, uh, hazard list and other things and saying, reviewed, 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 and signed off and initialed on a sheet of paper. Who did that review? It was the occupation health and safety manager. Was there any consultation and uh, participation in reviewing the risks? No, that's a non-conformity as well. So there's many of these components that we keep on focusing on. Objectives not very well defined, uh, resources. It's a hard one to put your finger on. Competence is normally 
quite well managed. Training is fairly well managed in most situations. Uh, what else? Emergency preparedness and response. Again, we find that you are not addressing, companies are not addressing all of the emergency situations. If you have a large chemical uh, warehouse, are you looking at the risks of spills? And do, are you doing drills for spills as well? Very often, that's not done. You do the normal fire uh, alarm, evacuate, and come back. Are we tracking information on how quickly we were able to evacuate? All of these things are things that are often found as hazards and uh, failures of the management system. Thank you very much, Kersha. That's that's really helpful. Um, OK, so we have reached um, our hour. Um, we have got a lot more questions. Um, but as promised, we will pull those questions into a uh, Q&A document for everyone, um, and that will be circulated in the coming week. So hopefully um, we will pick off as many of the questions for you um, and group them if there's anything that's common themes and, and send that out for you. Um, so yes, um, if you would like any more information um, and you're searching for more information, as well as the Q&A document, you can also take a look at the um, SAI Global website and the IOSH website. There is um, a lot of information on there on uh, 45,001. And if you could remember just to provide your feedback in the automated questionnaire that's going to open in just a few moments. Um, obviously, that all helps us to improve our communication. Um, and with that, I wish you all a good day um, or evening, wherever you are in the world, and look forward to welcoming you again to any future webinars. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you.